ready to begin our webinar titled Harnessing the Power of Positive Thinking, a guide to unlocking your full leadership capacity. Before I introduce our guest expert, let me remind you this webinar is a presentation of the Community Economic Development Fund in Meriden, Connecticut. I'm Frederick Welk, a business advisor for CEDF clients. The Community Economic Development Fund is a nonprofit organization which provides enterprises in Connecticut with term loans, lines of credit, and commercial mortgages when they can't get traditional bank financing. We welcome our webinar participants who include CEDF clients and business owners from across Connecticut. For practicality and to improve the program quality, we're muting the lines of everyone tuned in. If you develop questions, either please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or the chat feature, and we'll get to as many of the questions as the hour permits. The presentation is being recorded and CEDF will make the program available on our website in the coming days, cedf.com forward slash recorded presentations. Our thoughts and related self-talk, particularly during times of uncertainty, determine how we both feel physically and emotionally. When we choose a positive, hopeful mindset, our overall capacity to navigate uncertainty improves on nearly every level. In this webinar, we'll explore a wide range of proven techniques for being able to harness the power of positive thinking both in and out of work. David O'Brien is president of Connecticut-based WorkChoice Solutions. For 20 years, he's been helping businesses improve leadership and team effectiveness through training, coaching, and consulting. David works with companies of all sizes to bring about sustainable improvements in effectiveness. His books, The Navigator's Handbook, 101 Leadership Lessons for Work, Life, and The Navigator's Compass, 101 Steps Toward Leadership Excellence, is available online and in bookstores nationwide. Welcome, David. Thanks for helping us today. Oh, Frank, thank you very much, Fred. It's great to be part of this. I appreciate that very kind introduction. And I'd like to welcome everyone. Before we begin, I want to welcome one, everyone and thank you for joining us today. Uh, there's a story behind the flowers. Um, I guess as a beginning point, flowers make me smile. And my first thought in adding the flowers was that they would make you smile as well. But there's a deeper story behind it. When I began to deal with many of the same issues that each of you were dealing with seven, eight weeks ago, I had the realization that, well, we're going into this uncharted water at the early beginning or beginning of spring. And how much better that is than going into this uncharted water at the beginning of winter. At least for me, that began the, the whole cycle of hope and, uh, and guiding me to, to share with some of, of some of the concepts today in our program. Uh, but I wanna go forward, so thank you again. A couple of housekeeping tips. If you can, please close other apps that are running on your computer. Put your phone on silent mode if you would, please. Have others suspend streaming if possible uh, within your home, because many of you I know are working from home. And please, please, interact with chat and q and I want you to share your perspective. We're gonna have a Q&A segment at the end, but in between, I'm gonna ask you to give me some perspective to share some of your perspective with all of us. So please do that and we'll use the chat feature and then q and You can use chat, by the way, for Q&A in that segment as well. And then ultimately, this is your time. Please enjoy it. So I know I've, I'm very fortunate to have so many of you on, on the webinar today. Thank you again. This is a, the realization of a vision I had seven or eight weeks ago when I began to think about what can I do to help? What am I hearing as I talk to colleagues and friends and, and all different kinds of people from all different walks of life all over the country? And I realized that this would probably be a good starting point. There's some other things that I've done, but this is really about you and, and this is a little bit about me. For those of you that are not familiar with my work, the, the reference to the, the book in the middle there, Lessons in Leading Change, is a global MBA textbook that I had the good fortune of writing a case study for, a peer-reviewed case study. Um, and, and that's part of the work that I do as well. But again, this is so much less about me and so much more about you. So let's talk about what we want to get out of this today. What are my goals? What do I want to do for you? What do I want to bring to this? And I think in many ways, it's about strategies and ideas to help you get some perspective on acknowledging that you're not alone in this. Whatever it is you're thinking, whatever it is you're experiencing, uh, you're not alone. None of us are. We're all going through this together. But also creating a context to challenge 
some of our false assumptions, assumptions about things in terms of the, the challenges that we're dealing with, not to dismiss or diminish any of them, diminish any of them, but ultimately to be able to give us some insight into uh, a plan for applying what we're gonna talk about. And, and I think it's worth noting that so much of what we're gonna talk about is what I live. It's what I live every day and have lived for many, 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 many years. And that is what I like to think of as, particularly during times of, of change and, and uncertainty, that, that battle or fight between hope and fear. It's a normal human experience, and I think it's very important to acknowledge that it's something that all of us are dealing with. And hopefully, through some of the strategies that I'll be sharing with you today, it will afford you the opportunity to reframe, refocus, recalibrate, and ultimately manage it more effectively. So let's start. I'd like to get your input. This is the first chat segment. I'd like to know what is one thing you hope to leave with? So if you can please type in your answer using chat, I'll give you a minute or so to do that and I'll read most of them if I can get, all, get to all of my will. All of them are very important. So who, who wants to share something? What is one thing you hope to leave with? Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, better routines, more options. Okay, yes. Okay, st struggling with the, the battle of hope and fear, more clarity. Thank you very much. Managing my assumptions, terrific. A, a better routine, all great ideas. Thank you so much for sharing those. Look, at we have more here. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, hey, get, great to have you with us, Kathy. Thank you. Waving at you too. Great ideas for managing stress and sharing with others. And that's a really good point, sharing with others. That's part of my goal too, that you can use this material. As Fred said, it, the webinar will be available in the next day or two. I'll, I'll be talking more about that. I'll be getting some things to you in the next day or two. And I'm hoping that you do share it with others. So thank you very much. Let's go on to the next one. Let's, let's excuse me. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, I got lost there. So our new reality, thank you for all of that input. It's my goal to get to all of those. And I hope when we get through the, the end of the program today, you'll feel that each of those were spoken to. So our new reality, the world as we knew it 60 days ago has been turned upside down. I think all of us would agree with that. We could spend lots and lots of time talking about how things are different. But as I thought about how, what does it mean to me and so many people that I've spoken with in the past seven or eight weeks, I think it's a fair, a reasonable assessment of it that the world that we, we knew then 60 days ago was in, is in fact, it feels like it's turned upside down. But the good news is this, how we respond to that, that reality, that new reality that we share is largely a function of choice. How we respond is a lot to do with the choices we make. And just like, in, as I said, as when I, you saw the flowers, which again, I hope made you smile, that was a choice that I made seven or eight weeks ago when I began to realize that this is really uncharted water and there's so much unknown and, and there were a lot of things that were happening that pointed to things not getting better anytime soon. And, and I began to realize that it was up to me to choose to be very deliberate about how I view this and how I respond and how I let it impact me. And that flowers and the spring idea was one of the first. But I thought, you know, for those of you that I've had the good fortune of working with, and I know there are many of you on the webinar today, again, thank you, shout out to all of you. And for those that I haven't yet worked with, Again, thank you for being part of this. But those that do and have worked with me know that I use quotes a lot in my work. I like quotes because they make us think. And I, and I thought this was a really good, good way to start off our discussion. So being positive in a negative situation is not naive, it's leadership. And some of you know Ralph Marston. I, I, I encourage you to, if you don't know his work, check him out. He does have a daily motivation that he has on his website or that you can sign up for. But, but let's think about what does this mean to you? Why would I put this here? Again, for those of you that know me, you know that I'm a collector of quotes. And, and on that note, by the way, if any of you have uh, a favorite quote, please feel free to share it with an, in an email or follow up with me. I think my email was right there on the previous slide. So you'll see more information about that. You'll get a follow up from me uh, by, before the week is over. But let me think, let, let's think about this. 
So as I realized this, this being positive in a negative situation is not naive, it's leadership, it reminds me of another important quote and one of my favorites, in fact. And that quote is from Albert Schweitzer, who said, amongst other things, example is not the main thing in influencing others, it's the only thing. And, and just pause for a second and think about what does that mean in your world? Example is not the main thing in influencing others, it's the only thing. And I have to just take all of that in. I ask you to think about it as well, because what it reminds me of is that every one of us is a leader. Whether we have a title or even work, we're all role models. And I think that's another important frame of reference. And some of you have heard me say this, that in the 30 years that I've studied leadership, perhaps the number one, clearly the number one most important thing I've learned about leadership in 30 years is that it's about being a role model for the behavior we wish to see in others. Let me say it again. It's about being a role model for the behavior we wish to see in others. So we're role models. And that was another guide po post for me early on, knowing full well that there were a whole lot of people in my life, people that really matter, that I care about deeply, that were looking to see how I responded to these changes, how I responded to the uncharted waters. And so I ask you to think about the same because we're all role models. Let's go a little bit further and create some more context about our attitude, which again is a choice as we talked about. And we'll look more deeply at that in a little bit. But I wanna capture this, and you can read this. You know, For those of you that have, I've had the good fortune of working with, you know I'm not a slide reader, so I'm not gonna start today. You can read these. But I think it's important to, to there's two things, actually three things that I wanna highlight on this slide. The first is that much of this is about hope and fear. You know, we can talk about positive thinking and we can talk about being upbeat and staying positive and all of that. And, and I think that there are some times and there's some, I'm sure there are many people on the webinar today, myself included, that sometimes just don't feel that, just aren't feeling that. I, I, I'm reminded, you know, this program was originally, and it is, there is a three hour version of this program that I was originally asked to develop for a client up in Massachusetts, one of my banking clients, I guess it was maybe seven or eight years ago. And what happened there was they, they came to me, the head of HR approached me and said, we want you to develop a new program for us next year. And we want something that kind of bottles what it is you do to stay positive because you're one of the most positive people we know. And, and you know, you might wonder what was my first thought? Well, I'll tell you what my first thought was because I've been thinking about it. And my first thought was, if you only knew how much work it was, because it doesn't just happen. This is not about saying there's a switch that I can turn on or you can turn on or any of us can turn on that makes us positive. It takes effort some days. It takes deliberate effort. It takes mindfulness. It, it takes a conscious focused effort to manage those two, those two forces, hope and fear. It's, like, it's not unlike the two wolf story that I know a bunch of you read in my last newsletter. It's a lot like that. But so the other part that I think is worth noting is that it's about looking at this in a context of at least a favorable outcome. If you look at optimism for a second, you know, the, the tendency to expect the best possible outcome or at least a favorable outcome. And I think that's what's grounding us in the reality of it, because, you know, I've, I've said for a long time that being positive, thinking positive is not the absence of reality. It's the acceptance of reality that we have a choice and we can make that choice. So I'm gonna get the hang of my mouse here uh, and I'm gonna take you in the right direction now. So what value does was a positive attitude create for you and those around you? I'd like to get some more input. What value does a positive attitude create for you and those around you? Who wants to go first? Go ahead, thank you. Okay, Help, helps you all to have a more positive attitude helps them deal with their stress. What else? Please, okay, good, good, yep. Helps them see the opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay, good. And so I think what we'd agree, I, I think it's very fair to say that the value to working on that, to, to making that conscious effort goes a long way. Okay, there's some more, I'm sorry, thank you very much. Yeah, one of your favorite quotes, thank you very much. Awesome. Oh, you shared that. Awesome. Thank you very much. 
okay, yeah, you get more done, you feel better, you help people, that's for sure. And it creates that openness, so good, so powerful, for sure. So I think it's fair to say that we would all see value in it. But let's take a little bit deeper look at that, that attitude issue. And, and conventional thinking tells us that, oh, there's a lot of science behind this too, that, that our, our attitude isn't random. It's a collection of many things. It starts with our thoughts, the words we put to those thoughts, the beliefs that come out of those words, the behaviors and actions that follow those beliefs that we act on, and then ultimately our reality. But I think what's very important to note at the centerpiece of all of this are the choices we make. And so where we're gonna spend a little more time today is looking at how do those, what are those choices? How do we choose well? How do we choose the right things? And then ultimately get the most out of it. And so we look at this a little bit further. Another shared reality we have is that we all have a whole bunch of thoughts every day. Now this particular data is from the National Science Foundation. And, and there's a lot of different views of this. Some scientists, some people think that it's more. There's a lots that I've read about this. There are some schools of thought that say there's 20,000. There's others that say there's 70 or 80,000. Some, some studies I've set, seen or read say that 90 or 95% of our daily thoughts are recycled and maybe as much as 75 or 85% of them are likely to be negative. Well, whatever that number is, you can decide. I can decide, I can say that based on this framework, I think it gives us a good baseline to consider whether we subscribe to the 20,000 thoughts or 70,000 thoughts. The net result is we have a lot of thoughts every day. And ultimately, how we manage those and how they impact our lives has a lot to do with the time we spend thinking about them and ultimately in how we respond. So this is another good frame of reference. You know, again, for those I've had the, the good fortune of working with, you know, I talk particularly in this program a lot about negative self-talk and how it gets in the way and whether it's 50% of the recycled thoughts or 70% or 80%, the reality is they're there. They're there for every one of us. In fact, I've often said that in all the years I've been alive and all the years that I've been doing this work, I've never met any one human being that's exempt from it everybody deals with it. And so I think this cognitive distortion framework from Dr. Aaron Beck creates a context, another context for us to look at what is it that gets in our way? And, and, and I think it's very important to acknowledge that there's probably one or two, like I say in the bottom, the bonus question, there's probably one or two that, that you can relate to. Uh, in, in the spirit of transparency, I'll tell you that, that filtering is one of my favorites magnifying the negative aspects and blocking the positive inputs. And a recent experience with that, that oh, I can relate to so well that made me sick, was the whole stock market thing. And, and you, some of you, I'm sure many of you were following that. And if you go back five or six weeks, the sky was falling. And I refused to tune into any positive inputs. I was convinced that I had the facts, that the sky was falling, that everybody should get out of the market. It was, that was the thing we had to do. And I, despite many smarter people, including my wife, who fortunately is much smarter than I am, saying that's not the case, you need to stay put, you need to stay focused, you need to get through it, and we will. But ultimately, fortunately, because of that, I didn't do anything rash. But that filtering is one that, that I think, I know gets in my way sometimes, and as does emotional reasoning assuming that, that what I'm thinking reflects the reality, that, that it's exactly what it is, right? And filtering, yeah, really good point. So I ask you to think about which one or two of those might get in your way. But now I'd like you to think even a little more deeply. Uh, I like to use self-reflection questions a lot. And so I'm gonna give you about 30 to, well, I'll give you up to a minute to consider these. I'm gonna read them both, but I'd like you to think about what impact does my negative self-talk have on the important people in my life? What impact does my negative self-talk have on the important people in my life? And, and what's my single greatest motivator for managing my negative self-talk in a more proactive way? Please give it some thought.
So let's look at this cycle. We talked a little bit about it a moment ago, but recognizing the cycle, I think, is, is one of the first steps in being able to manage that negative self-talk, or as Dr. Beck says, the cognitive distortion. And I think many of you can relate to the text there on the right. When we become heavily invested in negative thoughts, we tend to act in ways that make those false assumptions seem real. And I think it starts with that negative self-talk. The sky is falling, the stock market is crashing, whatever it may be. And then that leads to a self-defeating attitude, which ultimately leads to self-defeating behavior and then, and then a negative outcome from there. So it's something to think about. But managing them, so what's, what's the second step? So that first step is that awareness, right? That awareness that says, this is the cycle that I'm, I'm, I'm in. And now what do, what do we do? What are, what are the things that we could do? And I think the path forward is now focusing more on what are those strategies? What are those solutions? And I think there's many really good suggestions here. And I'd ask you to think about that. So when you're having that negative, irrational, or exaggerated thought, ask yourself, am I jumping to conclusions? Am I exaggerating? What evidence do I have for this thought? You know, one of the things that I ask myself is, what am I doing to complicate things? Um, I, I remember there was a gentleman that I worked for many years ago that when, whenever I would bring a, anybody on the team would bring him a challenge or obstacle that we would present to him, he would, his response was always, yeah, but. And, and I used to find it irritating at first, but the point was he would make us think. And that yeah, but was getting us to think about what are we missing? And I think that was a common denominator. What, is, what are we missing? And so I think that the idea there is to be, begin to consider which one of these, maybe one or two of these, can you use in your kit, your toolkit, if you will, to help manage this more effectively? Because that's, that's one of the most important parts of it, being able to challenge it, to, to acknowledge that, okay, I can spend a lot of time going down this path, but where does it get me, right? Or I can take the time to challenge it and look at what my alternatives are. So I'm sure all of you know Viktor Frankl, of course, the author of the great book, Man's Search for Meaning, but he, he went on to say well, one of the things that stands out from that is when we are no longer able to change our situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And I think that that's a really good frame of reference. I know some of you saw this. As, this was one of my Motivational Monday quotes. For those of you who aren't plugged into that, check it out on social media. I started a Motivational Monday uh, initiative about six or seven weeks ago through June. It was, it's 14 weeks in, in length. Uh, this week's was Norman Vincent Peale, who said, change your thoughts and change your world. But this is a good reminder. And so I think everybody here would be quick to agree that we're not going to change what's happening out there, but we can change how we see it. We can change ourselves. And so I ask you to think about that. I'd like to talk a little bit about adopting some positive habits because this is part of the, the, the mindset that will give us that better range of how we respond. And you see here, think AM versus FM, count your wins more frequently. Well, the story behind that is rather long and I won't tell you, I won't burden you with the whole story, but the gist of it is this, AM is appreciation mode and FM is the fear mode. And every day, I believe we start our day with one or two of, with either one of those. We're either in the appreciation mode that comes out of a place of gratitude, or we're in the fear mode where we're back into that fear uh, that we talked about earlier. And so I ask you to think about which mode am I in? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in the context of choosing to change the channel in a little bit. But then look for the good. Keep a journal of, of the good things, the things that are happening. You know, I, it, it sounds minor, but, but here's one that happened to me just the other day that stands out that I actually wrote down and I shared with, I probably shared with three people so far, but it's an example of good stuff and how it reminds us of that. And so I had a, I had a customer service issue come up with an airline that I didn't expect a really good outcome from just a few days ago. I think it was last Friday. And so what happened was I was pretty sure 
It wasn't going to go real well, but I figured I'd give it a try. But I surrendered to it and I said, all right, it's whatever's going to be, it's going to be, I'm going to be fine. I just trust that there'll be an okay outcome. And so the very first thing that I noticed was while I was on hold, they were playing one of my favorite Otmar Liebert CDs. Now, I'm on hold with an airline, you're probably not going to get much good music, right? It's probably electronic music of some sort that's piped in from God only knows where. And yet I'm listening to this guitarist, this fantastic flamenco guitarist that I've never heard on any hold anywhere. But then it gets better. When I finally get a live person there, her name is Faith. And I begin to think, how's my faith right now? How am I doing? How is that going to influence the outcome of this call? And so I just thought that was really cool, really good stuff. And so I, sh I couldn't wait to share it with my wife, but I shared it with others. And so it's an example of look for the good. If we're looking for the good, we're going to find it, right? And choose our words. You can read the rest of these, but I think they're all really important. Surrounding yourself with positive people, I think, is a very, very important part of it, too. People that feed your head. People that feed your head. And, and, and I think it's so important. We're going to talk a little bit, little bit more about that in another context shortly. But, but remember social distancing. And then accept, don't judge. Gosh, you know, many of you have heard me say this, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this forever. Who are we to judge, right? Who are we to judge? Leaders don't judge. That's not what this is about. But we shouldn't judge ourselves either. Be fair. Be kind, right? And then limit the complaints. You know, that, gosh... You know, just as a context, the, the complaints, there were two stories that I thought of and I, as I was putting this together. One is a client of mine who some years ago got so tired of her team complaining that she created a complaint jar. And what they had to do is anytime they, anybody complained in the department, they had to put a dollar in the jar. And I remember her calling me and saying, hey, what do you think? And I thought, oh, it's a fantastic idea. I'll be sure to tell that story many times. And that was a number of years ago. But the net result was they got this, this team to be thinking about complaining and the impact that it had on everybody. And after the first month, they had enough money to have a nice pizza party. And then they decided, you know what, our goal is to have less money in here every month. And so what they did was over time, they reduced the complaints significantly. People were much more positive. And each quarter, they would take whatever money was in that jar and donate it to one of their favorite charities. But, but the other that, that I think is worth noting, so both of my books, the, the core books, The Navigator's Handbook and The Navigator's Compass, are a lot about what we're talking about today from a place of leadership in work and life. And, and I guess in many levels, at an important level, it is a, navigating is about taking the high road. It's about using our moral compass. It's about being a role model. And, and there are sometimes, because I'm human, that I like to complain. And, and I, I'm, am I proud of that? I guess not, but I'm just being honest. And, and one of my favorites is there'll be times where I'm whining and complaining about something and I'm kind of enjoying it. And my daughter or my wife will say, time to read one of your books again. And, and then I realize, well, okay, I need like another 20 minutes. Can I, could I be a whiner and complainer for 20 more minutes? Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because I think it's part of being human. I think it's okay, but try to limit it, right? I think that's the important part. I will not let anybody walk through my mind with their dirty feet. Oh, do I smile every time I see that? And right away, I am sure, I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I would bet that every single person on this webinar thought of somebody that walks through your mind with their dirty feet. They're all around us. You know, look, think back six, eight weeks ago, you could not turn on the television without having a lot of dirty feet walk through your head. Probably today too. I, I've reduced my, my television intake. I don't spend a lot of time in front of the TV anyway, thankfully, but I've reduced it even more so because of all the dirty feet that wanted to go through my mind. Is it important to be informed? Yeah, of course it's important to be informed, but I think it's also important to be mindful about who we're letting in there. You know, I, I remember an experience many years ago where I was really struggling with somebody that I was working for and a dear friend and mentor said, why are you letting her rent space in your head for free? And I thought, oh, that sounds such, like such a cliche. You know, thank you, that was great. And then the more I thought about it, I was thinking, wow, 
I'm, I'm giving up my power. I'm letting, I'm letting this person take up a lot of space in my head and, and with their dirty feet walk through my head. And so think about who, who does that in your world. But let's go a little bit further and look at some more positive habits. So help someone less fortunate. I was very blessed, very fortunate to learn at a very early age, and this is a shout out to my mom, who helped me to realize that there's always, always going to be somebody who's less fortunate than me, even on my bad days, even on my worst days, even on your worst days, there is always somebody less fortunate. And so being mindful of that and giving up some of our time, giving the gift of our time or talents, reaching out, this is such a powerful time, such an important time to reach out and connect with people. Pick up the phone, send an email, make a phone call, write a note, write a letter. Um, I think it's so, so important. And then say thank you more frequently, show more gratitude. You know, I'm reminded, I told you earlier that I developed this program maybe 10 years ago for a banking client. And when I was doing it, I don't know, it was maybe the second or third time, there was a, a, a point in the program, we're gonna do it here too, so I'll get you thinking about it. What do you do to stay positive? That was the question. And, and we're gonna to get to that in a minute, so I'm kind of priming the pump. But I asked that question and this young woman, maybe mid twenties raised her hand and she said, I have, I have a gratitude jar. And she went on to explain what a difficult, difficult life that this young woman had had, the, the really tough, tough experiences that she had that, that would break many, many people. I mean, this poor young woman had been through a lot of hardship. And with grace, with tremendous grace and clarity, she said, I find my gratitude jar in those moments of fear. I find my gratitude jar as a source of strength. And what she said, she, what she went on to say was that she had written down and continued to write down when something goes really well for her, or there's something that she's deeply grateful for. She takes a sticky note and just, and I think she actually used the example that she had an old pickle jar. Now, I don't know that, I'm sure there are many other vessels that would be more attractive to think about, but anyway, it worked for her, whatever it is, that's not the point what it's in, it's what you put into it that matters. And so think about that. And, and I often ask the question of, of particularly my coaching work, what is it that you have to be grateful for today? What, what gifts in your life do you have right now that you should be thankful for? That's one that I use. I, I challenge myself to think about that a lot. Uh, read or listen to motivational books. By the way, I, I have a terrific recommended reading list that I'm gonna send off to everybody with a link to the webinar recording and a, a very quick, easy evaluation. I'll be sharing that with you by Friday. Uh, and there's some really good books on there. And then tune out, tune out. I'm grateful to our, that our firm has managed to not lay off uh, any of our employees. Yeah, shout out, shout out to you. Fantastic. Um, how about that? But tune out the psychic vampires. I wish I could tell you that I came up with that. I didn't. Uh, uh, it was in one of these programs a number of years ago when I, uh, when I asked that question, what do you do to keep positive? Somebody said, I tune out the psychic vampires. And I thought, wow, I never thought of it that way. What are the psychic vampires? Well, they're the people that drain us, right? They're the ones like the Gandhi quote or Gandhi quote that want to walk through our mind with their, their dirty feet. And then ultimately choose our attitude. We can choose our attitude. I'm so sure of that. Some days it's hard. Some days it's really hard, but it's always available to us. I love this mouse. So what is one thing that you do to stay positive? Let's crank it up here. We had some really good things. Thank you for that. Thank you for that very kind feedback, Kathy and Veronica. Thank you so much. What are some things you do to stay positive? What do you do? So that, that gentleman in that example said that he tuned out the psychic vampires. I'm like, yeah, that's a cool one. I wish I could have thought of that. Or what else do you do to stay positive? Read, okay, great. Go for walks, exercise. What else? Okay, good. Music, love it. Crank up the music, huh? Uh, how about this weather? I know some of you are in different parts of the, the country, but right here in the Northeast, we've got fantastic weather today. I was out for a walk earlier. I'm grateful that our firm has managed to do that great. Music, walking, hiking, talking to friends, 
all really good stuff. All really good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. A beat walk at the beach. Oh, how great is that? Okay. Yeah. Take oh, Epsom salts in a hot tub. Love that idea. Oh, that's you're at the beach right now. God, that's fantastic. How cool is that? I would, I'm not there at the beach today. I'm here, but the sun is beautiful out there. Yeah. These are all good things, right? Feed your soul, feed your head, feed your heart, right? Whatever it is. Oh yeah. Look at that. Play with your two-year-old grandson. What a joy. How about that? These are all great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing them. So I want to take you a little bit further and talk about this 21 day challenge. Thank you. Those are all fantastic. This 21 day challenge. So we know conventional thinking science tells us that on average, it takes around 60 days. It's plus or minus a few days to form a new habit or to break a habit. And, and I'm, I've been of the belief for a really long time that small steps are better than no steps. You've heard, some of you've heard me say that a lot and I still believe it, I believe it deeply. Small steps are better than no steps. And when I've tried to make changes over the years and I've made a bunch of them, I'm still a work in progress. I find that if I take a 20 way, if I make a 21 day commitment, it's a lot easier for me to manage. And ultimately it gives me traction. And so what I'm gonna suggest you do is you try one of these four strategies, which I'll explain in a minute, 10 minutes a day for 21 days. And at the end of 21 days, you will have invested three and a half hours of your life. That's all it is, 10 minutes a day, 21 days, that's all it will take. And maybe just maybe you'll find that you've made some progress here. Maybe you'll find that you made a lot of progress here. At the very least, you will have, you will have discovered three and a half hours of you time. And that's a beautiful thing too. So the first one is to 10 minutes a day, examine and challenge your negative self-talk. What's my narrative? You know, I, I challenge myself with that too, a lot, you know, when I'm feeling it, because we know what it feels like. You know, somebody once said to me, their motivation for trying to think positive is simply, they know the difference between feeling good and feeling bad, or feeling positive and feeling negative, and ultimately being positive and hopeful is a much better place to be for everybody in their life. I think that's true. So taking time out, whether it's five minutes in the morning or five minutes in, in the evening, or both rather, five and five, or, or 10 at the same time. Develop a deeper sense of gratitude. Think about that AM versus FM, the appreciation mode. What, what does that bring to my life? What can that do for the people around me? Give yourself permission to change that channel. You know, I. I do that too, and I think about the AM and FM, and I, and I realize that as a reasonably intelligent human being, I have the capacity to change the channel. It's free. I can just say, I'm gonna change the channel, because this is a funk that I don't wanna spend another two minutes in. And I do, and, and, and sometimes it's easy, sometimes I have to work at it for several minutes, sometimes I have to work at it for several days, but that's okay. I know that there's an outcome that I, I, that's, worth, that's worth working at, right? And, and then calibrate your compass every morning. And, and where that really comes from, it comes from this deeply rooted belief I have that we all have a moral compass. It tells us who we are, it tells us what's right, it tells us what's wrong. In many ways, it arises from the navigator's handbook and the navigator's compass that again, believes we all have this moral compass that guides us. And, and what I have found, the, the, the deeper lesson in it for me is that one of the great things that's a standout quality of really effective leaders, perhaps one of the most powerful ones that I've discovered over the years, is that really effective leaders are not only clear on what their values are, they're really clear on how they live their values. That's, that's the moral compass. That's, the, that's congruence, right? And so here's what it is. It, comes, it came out of an experience beyond what I just shared with you. It came out of an experience about five, now maybe six years ago, where one day I just, it just came to my attention or I came to the realization that, wow, I am one distracted guy. I, my, I'm, my life is full of distractions. And I know that I can be a leader in every role I play. I know that everybody in my life deserves me to be a good leader, a good human being, a role, a positive role model. I get that, I really get that. I know that I can demonstrate leadership every waking hour of my day. 
But I also know that when I'm distracted and I get stuck on autopilot, I'm not doing so good. I, I'm just not being the leader that I want to be, that, I, that, you, that my, the people in my world want me to be and expect me to be and need me to be. And so I, after thinking about this for several days, I began to ask friends, what, are you distracted? Yeah, I go, my gosh, I couldn't believe it. It was refreshing to know that I wasn't alone. Everybody I talked to about it said, oh my God, that's nothing. In, in fact, you just inspired me to think of my favorite distracting. <laughs> I hadn't planned on sharing this, but you made me think of it. Thank you. So I was having this conversation with a group of clients one day about being distracted in this compass calibration. And this woman says, oh, you don't know distracted until you meet my husband. And I thought, oh, there's got to be a good story there. So I said, okay, so what is it? And she said, well, we recently came back from vacation. And like many people, myself included here, when you go on vacation, you put your dog in the kennel. And she said her husband was so distracted that when they got home, he picked up the wrong dog at the kennel. And it wasn't until their daughter got home from school and she said, dad, what, whose dog is that out on the breezeway? And he said, well, that, that's Coco. And she said, dad, that's not Coco. And when he came out and he looked, took a closer look, he realized that he had picked up the wrong dog. <laughs> and then he, he went on to say, I think that's probably why she had a hard time getting into my pickup truck. Um, at any rate, that's a, that, that, that made me feel better too, because I figured, well, I'm not, I've never done that. I've taken our dog to the kennel many times and I've always picked up the same dog. But let me go back into the compass calibrating uh, technique. Every day since that experience, when I came clear on the compass connection, I ask myself three questions. I start my day. It's part of what I call my compass calibration. The first question is simply this. What's important to me today? I purposefully block out 10 minutes without fail every single day. And I've been doing this now for over five years. It's part of my morning routine. I have a a morning routine that includes some prayer and meditation and, and this cal compass calibration before I do my to-do list. And that first question is what's important to me today. And I don't rush to answer it. That's, that's the fun part. I don't have to answer it. I don't have to rush to answer it. There's no wrong answer, by the way. How about, how about that for an idea? There's no bad answer. There's no wrong answer. So I give myself the freedom to just hang out and think what's important to me today. And once I start to get more clarity about what that is, I then ask the question, why is that important to me today? And again, I don't rush to do that either. I just hang, I hang out. I hang out in that space and think about what's important to me today. Why is it important to me today? And what I've come to believe with a lot of clarity is that that what's important to me connects me to my values. It connects me to that compass. And then when I ask the question and get clear on why is it important to me today, that connects me to my purpose. Wow, that, that's a powerful thing for me. And then, and then the last question, the third question is, how do I show up? And, and that's really, that translates to how do I behave? How do I show up? What do I want to be known for um, is another way of looking at it. But I think of it in a simple context. How do I show up today? How do I show up for this webinar? I'm showing up with a ton of gratitude that this is a vision I had seven weeks ago and I'm here with all the hookup, all the, all the, the, the bells and whistles doing this webinar with you. It's a joy, it's, it's, a, it's a really good place to be. And I thank you for making that real for me and, and making it a reality. But that calibrate your compass every morning is, are those three questions. What's important to me today? Why is it important to me today? How do I need to show up? And, and can I, I just, again, to be really clear in, in the spirit of transparency, some days I get stuck on the first question and I get 47 things in my mind and then I get frustrated and then I try, I try to go on to the second question and I get stuck and I start challenging why is that more important than this and yada, yada, yada. And, and then pretty soon I got to get focused on my to-do list and so I get off that center and get back into it. But even on those days, which thankfully, thankfully are fewer and fewer and fewer because of the, the energy that I put into it, um, even on those days, I still feel more grounded. I still feel more focused. So, so I share that with you with the hope that you find one of these. And there's more. Of course, there's more. There's things that you can do that you're comfortable with that resonate with you. And that's great. 
you know, the, the real message here is these, there's a whole bunch of things that are available to us that can help us get centered and grounded and manage this more effectively. And 21 days, I think, is a really good way to start. If I put up 60 days, I'd, I'd be yawning saying, yeah, good, like a, like a New Year's resolution, right? But 21 days, it's manageable. You know, I take it one week at a time, one day at a time. It works, right? And, and maybe, you, maybe you do a different chunk. I don't know. Uh, you know what works for you, and that's what's important. So you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Hmm. I wish I was a surfer. I never surfed, uh, but I don't think we have waves like that around here anyway. Uh, but I thought of that picture. I thought of that John Kabat-Zinn quote, and I realized, hmm, I'll let you decide what it means for you. And I know that some of you are familiar with his work. He is really the one of the great pioneers and, and uh, thinkers of mindfulness. But anyway, I'll ask you to think about in your world, what does that mean to you? Why would I put that in there? What message do, do you get from that? We can't stop the waves, but we can learn to surf. For me anyway, it, it, there's a sense of hope that arises from that. I'm not gonna change what's going on out there. You know, I, I just can't but I can change what's going on in here. I can really make a difference with that. And some days I do it pretty well, other days not so well, but I know there's always tomorrow, at least that's one of my hopeful thoughts, right? So please watch for a follow-up email from me in the next 48 hours that includes a link to the recorded webinar, as well as a webinar survey that I promise will not take you more than two minutes, at the most, at the most two minutes, and your feedback is so valuable. I really, really welcome it. I ask you to please do that. And then, and then the recommended reading list. I have the recommended reading list that I'll be sending with that email uh, at, by Friday at the latest. So, so now I'd like to open it up for Q&A. This is your time to ask questions. I, I invite all questions. Please, please go ahead. So thank you, Dave. Fantastic. That's very kind of you. You're very kind. Thank you very much. What else? How about some questions? I've got one for you, David. Go ahead. What do you I think is the most important thing for people to take away from this webinar today? Hmm. Thank you for asking, Fred. Um, I guess, number one, that, that your, your capacity to apply this is huge. Um, one of my upcoming motiv Monday motiv motivational quotes is from Robin Sharma, who says, Our, we're, we're, we're smarter and braver than we could possibly know. And I think that's so true for all of us. And so I think it would be having that clarity that I can do this, that's number one. Number two, I'd ask people to think about what was the most important thing that you took away? What was the one thing that I said that resonated with you? And then ask the question, why? Why is that? Why did that resonate with me? And then remember, small steps are better than no steps. My biggest challenge is creating a good routine since COVID. I'm lost in time. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I, I, I was, that was adding to my fear battle early on. And I came to the realization, I got to have a routine. So I have a routine. I have the morning prayer meditation, compass calibration. But then I decided that um, going for walks are really important to clear my head. And so I go for walks. Um, my wife and I started doing uh, crossword puzzles. And I realized, <laughs> I realized that this is why I hadn't done them before, because <laughs> some of them are pretty hard. But but I, I, I try to feed my head. Um, I, I get into that routine. I think a routine is so important. And realize, you know, for that, that particular question, you don't have to figure it out tomorrow. This is about small steps are better than no steps. You don't have to figure it out. Surrender to that. Give yourself permission to explore it. You know, maybe it's music. Maybe it's cooking. Um, that's one of my other things I've been doing a lot more of cooking. And that for me is such a, it's such a therapy for me because I never had time. None of us had time, you know, that's another thing to celebrate. All of us before March 15th or so were, were multitasking at a level we had never seen before. We didn't have time for many things, never enough time. 
And now we do celebrate that, be thankful for that. But in terms of the routine, experiment. Maybe try the compass calibration technique tomorrow morning. Maybe go for a walk. Maybe start a gratitude journal or a gratitude jar. But, but get in the habit of doing it with some consistency and maybe just use the 21 day framework uh, as a way of, of, uh, of considering it. What maybe else? We should, maybe we should remind uh, our participants that they can also use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of their screen oh, yes, or, or yes. use the chat. You can, you, and, thank you very much, Fred. In, in the meantime, I, I'm, I'm curious about this, David. You know, being a good leader is kind of hard enough on a sunny day. Uh, then we uh, kind of layer on all of the uh, crisis things that have been going on. Yeah. Uh, and, and now you're bringing us a message that, uh, that says, boy, you really got to work on yourself personally in order to, uh, uh, I guess, make the, make the best impression on uh, all of uh, the subordinates that you're trying to lead. That seems like that could be very uh, overwhelming for a leader. Yeah, but, you know, it starts there. It starts there. You know, I, 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 I read, I, I do a lot of work around emotional intelligence. I, I work with leaders. I, I, I've been trying to become a better leader most of my life. And one of the things that I'm reminded of was the, I read an article, I think it was in Forbes magazine several years ago that listed um, in order of importance, the most important critical or most important factors or characteristics of a, of a successful leader. And number one was self-awareness. And, and I think that it starts there. I agree with that fully. Uh, self-awareness is that taking stock of how am I doing? You know, that, that question, what do I want to be known for? Or that question, how do I show up today? Is a question that I ask a whole bunch of the leaders I work with. How are you showing up? If I were to ask your team, how are you showing up? What would they tell me? Do, do, do they know what your values are? Do you live your values? Do you, is there congruence? So yeah, it starts there. And, it's, and I think in many ways, and this is the good news here, it, it's about you know, somebody said to me not long ago, oh, maybe it was a year ago, they said, um, a leader I was working with, this was a lot of wisdom. I really love this story. Uh, he said, you know, I've come to realize the longer I do this, the older I get, that in many ways, this leadership thing is about the manners that we learned as kids, you know, <laughs> like something from Robert Fulgham or something. And he went on to say, it's about manners. It's about about being kind, it's about being respectful, it's about honoring your, your commitments, it's about all those little things. And, and I can't emphasize enough that often it's the little stuff that really matters. So yeah, Fred, I, I have to say, it, it, it doesn't just happen, you know, like the story of, of this client who wanted me to develop this program 10 years ago, being positive, being the most positive guy they know, doesn't just happen. I, I have to do a lot of work, you know, I have to pay attention to it, and, but I'm willing to do the work because I know, I know what the difference is, you know, and I, I encourage all leaders to consider that they have that capacity to, I'm, I'm just a fellow traveler here, you know, trying to leave the place a little better off. That's all. What else? Anything else? One I think, more. I think you've got a couple of comments oh, yeah, in the chat yeah. to acknowledge. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Especially, to have faith in yourself. All right. Yeah, I think it's important, especially during times like this, to have faith in yourself and your instincts. When you start doubting yourself and your abilities, you show you're overwhelmed. Your staff picks up on it and affects their faith in themselves. Oh, so true. You know, re oh, it's so true. It's so true. Thank you for sharing that. And so, but also don't be afraid to be vulnerable. You know, there's a, there's a great story that I'm going to be sharing with a good buddy of mine on Friday. We're talking about writing something about courageous leadership. Uh, Kathy, you're still on. Shout out to you. And so one of the stories we're going to have, there's a story that illustrates this really well, and I'll give you the short version of it. Uh, I was working with a group of senior executives at one of my insurance company clients, ah, blah, I don't know, we'll say six, eight years ago. And at the end of a two-day leadership, executive leadership retreat, I asked them to tell me one word they wanted to be known for when they went back to work. And I got things like results, bottom line, decisive, um, stuff like that. But one of, the, one of the leaders there said, I want to be known for being vulnerable. And I will tell you, folks, I never, up until that point, ever used the word vulnerable or vulnerability in a sentence with the word leadership, ever. And when I, I was, frankly, I was puzzled. 
I was curious, but I was puzzled in that way too. And so I asked him to explain it. And he said, I just want my staff to know that I'm real. And some days I don't have all the answers and some days I'm fearful too, but I know collectively we can get through this. I know their feelings are real. My feelings are real. Our feelings are real. And being open and realistic about that, I, I think it's liberating at some level. Now, it doesn't mean that we go there and we, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we overdo it, but I think it's about acknowledging that our influence is so significant. That's the point that, you're, that you raised. It starts there, but being okay with that and being open and maybe giving people an opportunity to talk about it is huge, right? So hope that helps. I'm at the beach for the sole purpose of resetting my mind because my mind was racing with negativity. I am so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, yeah. Uh, Brene Brown's work is about vulnerability. I know she does really powerful stuff. It's also true. Yeah. So it, it's all of those things, you know, it, it's taking it one step at a time. It's realizing we can do this. We can do this. We all have that capacity. Is it hard some days? Yeah, it's hard. It's real hard some days, but is it worth it? Yeah, I think it's worth it because when you realize that the world is so full of that, we have this capacity to be role models, to use our influence in a positive way, to be kind, to be respectful, to, to instill hope in people. You know, Napoleon, who was not by any means a favorite leader of mine or anyone's probably, uh, said that tr true leaders are dispensers of hope. If, if there was ever a time when our teams need hope, it's now, folks. And we have it within us to create that. We have it within us to bring them hope. So I leave you with that thought, but I want to leave you with one other thing before we run out of time. Imagine you're holding an eight ounce glass of water. If you hold it for a minute, there's no problem. If you hold it for an hour, your arm begins to ache. If you hold that same out eight ounce glass of water all day for maybe eight or 10 or 12 hours, your, numb, your arm becomes numb and almost paralyzed. If you hold it longer, it's even worse. Well, think about this. The stress and worries in our lives are a lot like that glass of water. If we think about them for a couple of minutes, nothing really happens. If we think about them for a couple of hours, maybe a little bit more. But if we think about them for days, day after day after day, like the water story, like the water example, they become paralyzing. And our ability to get unstuck, our ability to move forward, our ability to inspire hope in anyone's life is greatly diminished. So I'll leave you with that thought. Think about what you put into that glass. Think about how long you hold it. And don't forget, it's a choice. Thanks for letting me hang out with you. This has been the most joy I've had in a while. It's because of you for all the very kind comments. I'll be sending in questions and input. It's a joyful thing. Thanks, everybody. I'll be getting the, the survey linked to you. I have all of your emails. I'll be getting the survey linked to you by Friday with the, excuse me, the webinar link with the survey link and the recommended reading list. And I've got some real gems on there for you that uh, I'm grateful to be able to share with you. So. So thanks, everyone. Be well, stay positive, stay healthy. Thank you. Well, David, we appreciate your time today to school our small business owners on how to harness the power of positive thinking at such a crucial time for our society. Let's tell everyone again how participants can reach you if they have questions or uh, need to know more about work choice solutions. Sure. Thank you, Fred. So my work, my, uh, my business, my organization is Work Choice Solutions. That was on the early one of the earlier slides about me. It's www.workchoicesolutions.com. Uh, my email is d o'brien d o b r i e n at workchoicesolutions.com. On my website, you have all of my social media links. You're welcome to do that. I encourage you to, to if you're not linked in with me or connected on Facebook or Twitter, do so. You'll see all of my posts for the Motivational Monday series, uh, the quotes that came out on Monday starting four or five weeks ago, uh, plus my newsletter, plus a bunch of articles as well. Um, and then if, if you need to call me, feel free to call me. I'm at 860-242-1070.
I, I, Very good. I, I invite you to reach out to me if I can be of help in any way. That's why I'm here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> Very good, David. We sure appreciate it. As a reminder, this webinar was a presentation of the Community Economic Development Fund in Meriden, Connecticut. For the seventh year in a row, we're Connecticut's top SBA micro lender. We make business term loans at very nominal interest rates, as small as a few thousand dollars, and larger business loans, too, from a pool of loan capital provided by many of the state's leading banks. There are geographic and or income qualification requirements for the borrowers. You can find out more about all of this at CEDF.com. We've recorded this presentation. We're going to make it available in the coming days. Look under the education tab at CEDF.com or go to CEDF.com forward slash recorded presentations. I'm Frederick Welk. Thanks very much for joining us today.